the Emperor, a peerless psyker, scientist supreme, and god made flesh upon the battlefield. The culmination of these traits were to be his greatest achievement, his sons. 21 demigods imbued with aspects of himself, humanity's best traits taken to their extremes, courage, determination, guile, curiosity, among many others. Unfortunately, one of these brothers has been unfairly maligned. Through ignorance, memes, and occasional bad writing, he has come off not as a beacon of virtue led astray by logical arguments and reason, not as a serious intellectual with actual grievances, but as an illogical, over-emotional joke. Pfft, not him. He's always been terrible. But he didn't have to be. Anyway, the Lord of Iron, Master of the Fourth, and the Hammer of Olympia. It's Perturabo. As is fitting for a demigod from the planet named Olympia, his story is a tragedy, both in and out of lore. Hi, I'm Sio. I want to take you on an adventure. Perturabo's story is one of great possibilities and inconsistent execution. My purpose is to understand what he is, what he could be, and work his story like a piece of wrought iron until it lives up to its potential. Like any fortress to be sieged and fortifications to be later improved, an understanding of how it currently stands is needed. He arrived on the planet Olympia in a pod from the sky and grew at a prodigious speed. He started his life by killing flock animals, basically sci-fi, not sheep, and eating them raw. He would cover his naughty bits with their bloody skin and get chased around like a madman by the piss-scared shepherds. Now imagine chasing down this wild, blood-caked, skinwalker-looking boy. You'd need to have balls of steel. Anyway, eventually, in his scheduled chase session, he had accidentally led one of the younger lads to a giant feathered snake-like monster called the Jalpida, which started voring the boy. Pert weighed the proposition of helping the young man. Due to his young, albeit extremely fast-growing, stature, and lack of any real weapons, he couldn't justify a reason to help such horrible odds. So, despite the boy's father begging Perturabo to help, he just let the snake bugger off. Days after the boy died, Perturabo would eventually slay the beast by forging a mighty weapon in the workshop of a shocked local smith. He accomplished this due to his ability to instinctively understand the workings of anything he came across. After slaying many other hot local monsters in his area, he got a random hair up his ass and decided to climb a mountain. On that mountain, something vague happened to him, and he lost all of his memories until that point. This is where the men of the Tyrant of Lokos, the region's ruler, found Pert and brought him to their master. Since his mental acumen surpassed even his inhuman physiology, he was lusted after. And now, although Olympia was a stand-in for Greece, it's not in that way. Uh, it's said that the people of that world are paranoid and power-hungry, and so Perturabo would be the key to all of his plans. Perturabo saw through this, of course, but used the tyrant as a means to an end to reunite with his father, whom he logicked out must be out there somewhere in space. The tyrant eventually adopted him, and showered him with all manner of praise and materials to do whatever he wanted, but none of it satisfied Perturabo. He all but screamed, you're not my real dad, and hid in his nerd tower until he was needed for war, or to show off the sophists parading around Olympia as wise men. Eventually, Perturabo helped conquer his world. And not too long after, his father had finally arrived. Soon, he is reunited with his legion, and upon seeing their war record, KD ratio, and color scheme, he is appalled. So, what is the response to seeing that the men of his seed had needlessly thrown away too many of their lives? He decides to commit decimation on his entire legion. For the non-history buffs, decimation is an ancient Roman punishment. It is where one out of every ten men would be murdered by the other nine for crimes like cowardice, mutiny, desertion, and insubordination. After endearing himself to his legion and the rest of his found brothers, he proceeds to go out and take on shitty and glorious missions. He was then given mostly shitty and glorious missions. Too prideful to openly say, fucking suck it, I'm gonna go for glory. Presumably to show that there is never a challenge too difficult that he could not solve. He continued on grinding them out, and grinding is what he did. Once again, despite all the talk about his logical mind, he did the dumbest thing and ground down his entire legion fighting in the most brutal ways. After a particularly horrible campaign, he found out that his home world of Olympia had rebelled, and he fucking loses it. He flies his ass over there as quickly as he can and puts on a little show and dance to really dig into the people about how badly they fucked up. 
before he orbitably bombs some of them and has his legion terrorize the cities that he did not. Once Horus, his closest brother, had turned, he was so embittered by the state of his own life and under the impression that the Emperor would not forgive him for fucking his own rebellious planet, he joined Horus's rebellion like that. Now, quick reminder, he thought the same Emperor who was fine with post-Monarchia Logar smiting entire planets so long as they pacified others would be so cross with him that they would basically wipe his entire legion and erase him like two of his other brothers? Come on, it doesn't make any sense. Also, it was not an irreversible fucking, just a massive lubeless one, meaning he done blowed up a lot of cities and enslaved many of the people, but it's not like he committed exterminatus on the planet. They could have rebuilt, and they could have still had an entire planet dedicated to the Emperor. He then proceeds to do a bunch of big brain tactical stuff before being the only sane man directly orchestrating the Siege of Terra. He does it until he's had enough of everyone's anarchistic shit and fucks off into space. That's about where it leaves him pre-40k. There's some stuff with fighting with his other brothers and petty nonsense, but for the main characterization that we get of Perturabo, that's the gist of it. Ironically, the most schizophrenic depiction of a character isn't Cruz, but the most logical, steadfast Lord of Iron. I'd argue his depictions and references to him fall into three camps. Dour and shitty, logical, cold, and practical genius, humane, and fallible. Starting with Dower and Shitty, his portrayal as a bitter piece of shit begins early in the Black Library Horus Heresy series. In books like Fulgrim, we have references to him like this. Fulgrim recoiled and turned back to his brother, the disgust at such a menial role horrifying and repugnant. The exquisite sensation flooding his body at the baiting of the War Master faded and left him hollow inside. You would consign me to the role of Castellan, as some housekeeper making your property ready for your grand entrance? Why not send for Perturabo? This kind of thing is more to his liking. Perturabo has his own role to play, said Horace. Even now, he prepares to lay waste to his home world in my name. We shall be hearing more of our bitter brother very soon. Have no fear of that. We see where what should be mutual respect from a perfectionist by practice to a perfectionist by nature, replaced with callow disregard, trying to pawn off menial work to a lesser. Now you can say, CEO, come on, it's Fulgrim at the head of the heresy. Of course he's going to be a bit of a cunt to Pert. Instead of being flashy flash, he flashes a construction site. And I can grant that logic to some degree. But Horus, who should basically be one of his only friends, still talks shit about our quote unquote bitter brother. While Horus could be using his charisma to match Fulgrim's energy, what it does is portray to the reader that Pert is an entirely known quantity to his brothers. A bitter shit. Let's look at examples from both of Perturabo's origin stories. In the Primarch novel, Perturabo, the Hammer of Olympia, we see Damakos, the tyrant of Lokos, as he comes to Perturabo's tower to discuss his upcoming name day. Like any father dealing with a moody son, he is frustrated and goes on to say, you are the most honored youth in the city, and you behave poorly. Do you expect gratitude for the endless tests, for the sniveling intellectuals who would come to denounce me as a fraud, for the members of your court who would see me dead? These are unpleasantnesses that any highborn of Olympia must suffer. It is the price of power. When will you see, my lord, that I am not like you? Perturabo's anger was always sudden. His shout was deafening. The avians in their cages cooed unhappily. Nevertheless, he held his pen away from his work, so as to not spoil it. A single drop of ink fell to the floor. When will you see that it does not matter what you are, but how you are regarded, said Damakos. You resent me when I have done nothing but show you kindness. I love you as a son. Fathers do not use their sons, grumbled Perturabo. This is the response of a moody, hormonal teenager ungratefully raging at his wealthy father for not spending enough time with him. Not the reply of a being who prides himself on logic and could count the atoms of the hairs in your head in the time it takes you to do simple multiplication. In the short, titled The Emperor's Architect, it follows two remembrancers, Marissa and Oliver, as they travel across Olympia to write a book about Perturabo. In an attempt to learn more about his early life, despite Perturabo not being available, they go to a smith shrine and find a man named Gerademos. He is the son of Andos, Pert's adoptive brother. They stumble upon a ruined wreck, and Gerademos pays them to fuck off with a story about it. It goes like this. 
Andos was a noble man, Jared Damos began. He was kind and thoughtful. Indeed, he was so different to the rest of Damakos' kin, there were whispers he was a foreign seed, sprouted in the poison soil of that house. Is it true? asked Oliver. No, I have myself been gene-typed to settle the matter. Damakos was my great-grandfather. Then you could be rich, said Oliver. Rich? Jared Damos smiled humorlessly. I would have nothing to do with him. He was as bad as his foster child, said the smith angrily. Andos was a great craftsman. Were it not for Perturabo, he would have been the genius of this age. There was little art or craft he could not turn his hand to, nothing he could not make beautiful. None could surpass him, except Perturabo. Do you think Damakos, his own father, saw that? He did not. Damakos was bedazzled by Perturabo and what service the foreign youth could do for him. Gerard Demos pulled out the iron and commenced working it with his hammer. Between ringing strikes, he continued his story. But Perturabo did see Andos' worth, and it made him seethe. He goaded Andos constantly into competition, vying with him to see who could make the most marvelous art or fashion the finest weapon. Everyone knew Perturabo exceeded Andos in every way, none more so than Andos himself, but the mere possibility that anyone, even his own adoptive brother, could better Perturabo's talents stoked his rage. Perturabo always had an excess of rage. So, Perturabo contested with Andos, and beat him, and contested with him again, and beat him, and each time he exulted in his triumph. Ugh, it was pathetic like a ten-year-old crowing that he outmatched his three-year-old brother in the wrestling ring. This does not accord with the official accounts of his life, said Marissa. A hard strike sent a fan of sparks from the iron. Jera Demos held up the iron in his tongs and peered at it critically. It was taking the shape of a sword. The metal cooled to a dull ruby and he thrust it back into the coals. The bellows began their pumping once more. Of course it doesn't. Perturabo wrote the official accounts. Before the Emperor came, he presented a face to the world that he thought of as calm and commanding, but was in truth sullen. He hid his envies, though not all of his rages. The story was told to me by my father, who heard it from my grandfather. You want a true account of the Primarch? You won't get a better one than this. One day, Perturabo challenged Andos yet again. By this time, my grandfather's patience had run out. He had come to middle age, and he had withdrawn to his workshops. He had no desire to prove anything to anyone, only to continue his business in the shadow of the warlord of Locost as best he could. Perturabo would not let him be. He pushed and pushed, demanding another match of skill. Andos's own temper was slow to kindle, but it finally caught, as any man's eventually will, and so he took Perturabo's challenge. They were to make statues of Sashal of Drast. He's one of our culture's heroes, he said sourly. Yet another bloody murdering tyrant. We have an addiction to them. This time, Andos strove harder than he ever had before. He put all of his talent into that statue. Puturabo finished well before, but Andos would not hurry. Weeks went by. Puturabo's ego was soothed by what he thought of as another victory. That is, until Andos was done, and the statues were set side by side and unveiled. The smith took the metal from the fire and began again to beat upon it, speaking between strikes. Puturabo's statue of Sashal was perfect in every way. There was not a single flaw. In composition, it was arresting. As a depiction of the human form, it was a marvel. Sashal looked like he might step down from his pedestal at any moment, that he would breathe and live as a revenant in bronze. The people of the court were moved to tears. So why did he destroy it? asked Marissa. Gerard Demo snorted a bitter laugh. <laughs> because there was a problem, and for Perturabo, it was a very big problem. Gerard Demos's hammer rung off the metal. Andos' statue was better. A lot better. Perturabo's was technically period all right, but Andos somehow trapped the man's soul in bronze. When viewed from different angles, the statue revealed another facet of Sashal's character. Andos depicted pathos and tragedy. Through subtle means, he told the story of Sashal's life in that one single figure. Compared to Andos' statue, Perturabo's looked hollow. The way they tell it, there was never a finer piece of art made on Olympia, and Perturabo knew it. 
His face went gray, but he congratulated my grandfather and the court gave Andos high honors. They were going to set the statues side by side above the Kelfon Gate at Locos in honor of both men. That never happened. Because Perturabo destroyed them both? said Marissa. The hammer clanged again many times before Gerardemos answered. You catch on quick, he said. He obliterated Andos' statue completely. Of course, no one said anything about it. It went unremarked upon like the rest of Perturabo's petty rages. His own statue he smashed into that mangle you see there, but he was careful to leave enough of it so that the artfulness can still be glimpsed. One of our noble lord's more subtle lessons for us. Andos and Perturabo never spoke again. Grandfather let himself age naturally and died nearly 90 years ago. Such a waste of a talent. Gone while his parasitic sister and father ruled over us. He shook his head angrily. Andos had something Perturabo never had. What is this thing? asked Marissa. Gerardemos grunted. <laughs> Humanity. This shows Perturabo as a petty creature with a massive ego. Earlier in the story, we see a young Perturabo who is the exact opposite, where he is so human that he helped the people by murdering monsters specifically because he wanted to help them. So much so, he did not even conceptualize the idea of payment for his deeds. The two passages in concert are clearly trying to tell us that he started out as innocent, but his time among the Olympians tainted him, something foul. While I like that idea, the implementation doesn't follow. You don't go from an earnestly philanthropic, effortless genius to an angsty, petty dick in only a few years. Even taking into account the weird decision to have his mind wiped, starting fresh on the mountain, it just doesn't add up. Moving on to his depiction of being logical and cold. We can start with his portrayal in the audiobook Perturabo, Stone and Iron. Here we see the Iron Warriors engaged in conflict with the Orcs, alongside the Imperial Fists. Perturabo and the 33rd Grand Battalion's officers watched as the Orc attacks continued. Schematics of the fort and initial deployments, supplied by the Imperial Fists themselves in a data burst, were overlaying the visor displays of the Iron Warriors as they took in the storm assault's every aspect. Ferex highlighted part of the fort's display for his brothers with a blink click. This is their greatest weakness, the Night Bastion. Due to the angle of the gatehouse and the main redoubt, it is the first to be hit with overspill from any assault coming down the valley. It was not built expecting such pressure. You are correct. Ferex felt his fellow officers bristle. Every one of them was desperate to earn the Primarch's approval, and the fact that a Tech Marine and not a Bastion commander had won it rankled. For his own part, Perturabo said little or nothing in response to his subordinates' appraisals. The new battalion was being tested, and the results would likely remain private. According to my estimates, their ammunition will be wholly expended around an hour after sunset. Not that long. At current rate of expenditure, they have half an hour at most remaining. Again, Metellus visibly stiffened at his fellow captain's response, but dared say nothing in the presence of the Primarch. If Perturabo was aware of the silent bitterness passing between his officers, he made no indication of it. If they can disengage from the outer bastions and offer a tighter defense from the central keep, I'll give them a few hours yet. Lord, we I... have been observing this assault for almost three hours. In that time, none of you have done anything other than heap scorn and derision on the defensive works below. You disappoint me. Captain Vorens is one of the Imperial Fist's foremost wall holders. From the works you yourselves have raised on this hill and the opinions you have offered, it is clear not one of you will be able to construct the defenses the Seventh Legion has here, or hold them against an equivalent Xenos attack for more than five hours. Metellus was the first to find his voice and respond. But Lord, they're sighting. They abandoned this hilltop without a fight and left themselves utterly exposed. Had we not stormed these positions, they would be already overrun. They abandoned it because I ordered them to. They abandoned it because I told them I would secure this hill and prevent any Xenos bombardment. You all know not to underestimate an enemy, but neither should you let rivalry cause you to underestimate an ally. They are stone, and we are iron. Both have strengths, both have weaknesses. We are here so that you may learn of both. I see there is still much to teach you, but we are out of time. Artillery Master Lorax, you may open fire! Aye, my lord. All batteries fire! As we can see, Perturabo here is not a petulant, ego-driven madman, but one driven by logic and results. Here, he does not let the petty squabbles between his legion and the Imperial Fists get in the way of the truth that they both have strengths and weaknesses, and that if his iron warriors are to improve, they need to be aware of it and learn from them. Now mind you, if we had a Venn diagram of each aspect of Perturabo, this would probably be in the uh, hanging over in the shitty column as well, 
uh, as he uses the lives of the Imperial Fists to, you know, make a point to his men. All right, let's switch gears to the book Slaves to Darkness. It's a compilation of different stories of various chaotic forces leading up to the Siege of Terra. The perspective of note here is from Volk, one of Protorabo's commanders, close friend to the Herald of the Sons of Horus, Argonus, and, spoiler, eventually the first to be infected with the Obliterator virus. You know, the one that makes you look like you covered a normal man action figure in flesh-colored Play-Doh and smushed in an entirely shattered tank and every sort of loose bit and then went to the bottom of your toy box and gathered every loose gun you could find and smushed it in there as well? That's, that's the, he's, he's the first one of those. Slaves to Darkness has multiple fantastic portrayals of Perturabo as a cold and logical force of nature. So much so I had a hard time picking which chapter I thought encapsulated it the best. I decided to skip the chapter where Perturabo, spoilers again, skip ahead a couple seconds, kicks Angron's ass into the dirt as their ships do battle with the Ultramarines overhead. While the mental image that scene conjures is one of the most metal things ever, I think Folk's part of Chapter 5 perfectly exemplifies this aspect of Perturabo. So much so, I'm just going to read you the whole thing. Volk. Perturabo watched the flow of cold data from the heart of the Iron Blood. Screens hung from the ceiling around him. Tactical information scrolled across them in an endless cascade. These were not displays that turned details into maps and readouts. This was primary data from across the Ironblood's fleet. Engine outputs, gun charge readiness, position error margins, crew status, all of it was passing over the screens, undiluted and unmediated. Perturabo had been absorbing it all for an hour, only his eyes moving. Occasionally, the arrangement of the screens would alter, but the Lord of Iron remained still at their center. His Iron Circle automata surrounded him in a loose ring. Green sensor beams flicked from their eyes, washing back and forth over their surroundings. Volk had come from the surface after his final ground action on the slopes of the mountain. Trench dirt still clung to the scratches in his armor, at odds with the sterile surroundings. He had stood in the Iron Blood Strategium only once before. Then, as now, he was struck by the quiet. Others who saw the Legion as the breaker of fortresses and heard the iron in their names as the roar of cannons would have been surprised at the peace of this place. The chamber was circular, its floor tiered so that the banks of the system controls rose from the open space at the center to a domed roof of bare metal. Hundreds of servitors sat in cradles of tubes and wires, their skin gray from years spent in perpetual gloom. Black uniformed serfs moved silently amongst them. Here and there, tech priests in white robes bent over control panels, metal hands clicking softly as they tapped keys and adjusted dials. All of them carried out their tasks with barely a word. The chamber was buried deep in the Iron Blood's hall, its corridors watched by slave gun nests and cybernetic maniples. On other ships, the place of command would have been the bridge. The light of the stars would have fallen through huge viewports, but not the Iron Blood. Even before the first engagement of the war, Perturabo had kept the interior of the ship sealed from the view of the void beyond. Part of this was purely practical. Viewports were points of weakness in the hull, and afforded no advantage in battle. Their absence also focused the mind. Everything that you needed to see was before you. It said, let nothing distract you from it. The last reason, Volk suspected, was a lesson taught by siegecraft and retaught by the last decade fighting warriors who possessed the same base capabilities of the 4th Legion. A typical bridge, high on the hull of a ship, was too easy a target. All elements are in place, said Perturabo, his voice low but carrying across the chamber. Begin the first phase. By your will, came the reply from the serfs. The hum of control systems blended with the murmur of the crew passing orders. The vibrations of the ship were a bass note that rose through Volk's feet, he had tried to read and collate the data passing before Perturabo, but he had eventually had to admit defeat. There was simply too much. He had risen through the Legion's hierarchy and passed through layers of mental conditioning that allowed him to function at levels of tactical complexity that would break most mortals' minds. But this was like trying to drink from a waterfall. He could read generalities and hazy impressions of the reality of the void outside the ship, but that was all. Argonus removed his helmet and locked it to his belt. The light of the data screens flickered in his eyes. Volk could tell that the emissary was about to speak. You wish to see what the War Master's command has brought about, said Perturabo, his head turning to look at Argonus. His skin was parchment pale, drawn tight over the skull beneath. 
His armor hissed with hidden pistons, flexed like muscles. Argonis nodded. Perturabo gestured. A cone of light sprang into being. Crayed and its systems glowed green in the projection. A spiral of ships extended from the planet's northern pole, each marked in green. The enemy war fleet held off, watching and waiting to see what the Lord of Iron was doing. Sensor data ringed each of the enemy ships. Most were medium tonnage warships, crewed by humans. Two were behemoths of the void. The Akrisas and the Nebula Born were both war barks of the Cassini dynasty, exiled lords of the Jovian Void clans, returned to the edge of the Galactic Rim. Besides these hung the serrated barb of a lone legionary's Astartes cruiser. The Council of Eternity gleamed with bronze plating, and the symbol of the Ultramarine sat above its prow, clutched in the claws of a silver hawk. It was a considerable force. Not enough to blockade a world, but more than enough to dispute one. Volk took in the display, his eyes moving over the clusters of enemies, assimilating the position. Argonus spoke his thoughts out loud. That is the dagger of Orion, said the emissary, nodding at the deployment patterns of the enemy ships. The ultramarines are cautious, but they will strike once it is clear what our ships intend. You're a scholar of void war as well as an ambassador, said Perturabo. Tell me then, what would you do to break clear of the system? Argonus did not hesitate. Send two substantial forces running for the inner reaches of the system. Draw them to counter, and then advance your fleet directly at those trying to contain you. Concentrate strikes and burn at a maximum speed to break through. Simple and direct, rasped Perturabo. I can almost taste the Chthonian ash in it. Perturabo's eyes narrowed as they turned from the emissary to the screens of data. But Gilliman's dogs stand against us, and while they are many things, they are not fools. He breathed and raised a hand. The weapon pods on his back vented cooling gas in a hissing exhalation. His fingers opened up with a melody of soothing gears. The thrum of distant engines increased. On the display, the markers of the iron blood began to move. They have already theorized that part of the fleet might be trying to break out. Signals and data markers sparkled amongst the iron warrior ships. They have already made allowances for that effect. The iron blood's fleet was accelerating. The spiral formation of the ships began to rotate faster. Your plan would still work. We would still break through. Casualties would be almost identical to those we shall sustain. Volk watched as the enemy elements began to respond. Ordnance launch warnings flashed besides the cluster of ships. In his mind, he heard the roar as the torpedoes kissed the void, and the engines flared to full power. In the stratagem, all was silent, and the distant growl of the plasma reactors sounded like the echo of gathering thunder. Inadequate solution, said Perturabo, but one that misses the point. Weapon and full battle readiness icons flashed through the Iron Warrior's fleet. There are four elements to our force. One remains here to hold the void for as long as the battle on the surface lasts. Two are battle fleets that will make for Mondus Kraton and Numenos, and from there travel to the Beta Garmin Breach to the muster at Ulinor. Lord Perturabo called the tactical surf from the tiers of the system stations. All elements await your word. Perturabo did not shift his gaze from Argonis. The emissary returned it unblinking. Do you know what the true nature of iron is? Even when still, even when it is a lump of ore in the ground, iron dreams, for it knows its purpose. He looked at the surf who had spoken a second before. He nodded. That purpose is to cut. The surf turned, gesturing to her underlings. To crush, said Perturabo, in a voice that rasped like a wet stone on a keen edge. Orders crackled across the vox. The scads of data reflected in Perturabo's eyes flickered and began to flow faster. To break. The hollow display was rotating, the view broadening. The entirety of the Iron Warrior's fleet was dropping into formation around and behind the Iron Blood as the vast capital ship accelerated. The enemy ship's groups were moving too, burning on attack vectors, sliding against the stars so that they could plunge into the mass of Iron Warrior ships like hawks through a flock of doves. But they were moving too slowly, and Volk could tell that in their theoretical projections, the commanders had assumed that a force would remain close to Kraid, and that even if they came into strength, the Iron Warriors would not come as a whole, that they could not cohere as fast as they had. I have always admired Chthonian directness, said Perturabo his gaze again locked on Argonis as the glow of battle data flared and shifted behind him. 
the spear thrust, the single strike which ends all conflict. But a spear thrust is only as good as a target it strikes at. You're not withdrawing from the system, began Argonus. Volk's gust of laughter cut him off. Volk looked at the Primarch, biting back the cold humor that had risen in him as he realized what they were doing. Perturabo glanced at him, and in the lightless depths of the Primarch's gaze, he saw a flicker of something he had not seen in a long time. A connection. A moment of shared understanding, so strong that for that instant, he felt that his next thought was an echo of Perturabo's own. Perturabo did not answer for a moment. He was watching as the casualty values rose. Because we were made to build, but now we exist to destroy. Then he raised a hand, and with a flick, the screens of data were blank, and the air where the hollow projections had been, empty. Send the orders for the fleet elements to separate, and translate to the warp as soon as we are past the system threshold. Our course? Asked Argonus as Perturabo turned and moved towards the chamber doors. The iron circle turned their green gaze on the emissary. Fine gears clicked and whirled in their arms as they shifted posture fractionally. Volk was reminded of the muscles flexing in a warrior's sword arm. Argonus's face remained impassive. Where are we bound? He called. Even Angron's wild dogs need bullets and armor, said Forex. So we are going to the forge that feeds them. Sarum, said Perturabo without turning. We are going to the cradle of the dragons of war. The first time I read that was when Perturabo as a character really came alive to me. I had read the memes about him being a whiny cunt with a self-imposed sideline streak like an angsty 14 year old in 2007, but this felt like he had finally been pushed to his limit. Where regardless of what baggage he had clung to before, he had given himself permission to fully embrace who he was through his most destructive urges. The image of him sitting there, just absorbing raw data of everything his entire fleet could gather, and in his head, parsing it and extrapolating an optimal fleet strategy, was so evocative of the different level he was on. It sold the Siege of Terra, and the idea of him orchestrating a space and land war by himself, despite his brothers being drugged up on retard god juice. Expanding upon that, something else I really dug about his portrayal is the question that it poses. Is this cold, almost robotic exterior who he really is, being let loose, or is it just a show of stoic confidence for his men and the guest? That question kept kicking back in my mind when he's later beating down Angron, and he's snarling and roaring out insults about how he's just a puppet of corn now. I love it because it makes him that makes him so much more human because he's such a he's, he's this entirely hyper competent guy like a Japanese salary man who's had enough of all of the bullshit who knows how to manage people and put on the face but just he's at his limit and now he finally has the tools to let loose. Practical genius, humane and fallible. This is the golden area. These depictions are not jokes or caricatures, but well-rounded portrayals which show that despite his superhuman abilities, Perturabo is deep down as human as any of us. Let's work backwards for a moment and take a look at the book Angel Exterminatus. I think this is one of the most famous Primarch interactions, where Perturabo just commits facial abuse on Fulgrim. Like Slaves to Darkness, there's a lot of good material that would feel wasteful to not bring up. But as to not read another entire quarter chapter, I'll describe it and drop the excerpts on screen. We see Perturabo waiting for Fulgrim while talking with his trident, his inner circle consisting of three of his closest commanders. Pert jokes with them about Fulgrim's word choices, and then remarks about the change in Fulgrim, effectively calling out his new, somehow more, flamboyant self. The book outright states the convergence of perfection between the two brothers, and how that was something they at least respected in one another. There is then this fantastic scene that feels correct for a genius who prides himself on logic and efficiency. Kroger, one prong of his trident, references their opposition as loyalists, and Perturabo erupts, then quickly forgives and moves on. That efficiency and regulation of emotion is way more fitting than any of the whiny bitterness of previous entries. He lets himself feel and express emotions, but doesn't wallow in them, instead moving on to the next task at hand. Another interesting thing is that he understands the semantic word games and their subtle mental effect on themselves as well as others, and he looks to cut it off at the neck. This understanding of people at scale, similar to a machine, feels more like the expected cunning of a Primarch. I also think they could speak to his mental justifications. Although he's not too proud to take on the dirty jobs, he is a deeply proud man. 
proud enough to not complain about just how horrible the conditions actually were. That being the case, since there's no getting around the fact that being a traitor is a foul, terrible thing, he can't acknowledge it. His cause is just because it has to be, for the morale of his men as well as Pert, even if he has to keep telling himself that. He is then informed that the Emperor's children have done away with their intricate, perfected landings, illustrating further that them purple boys ain't right. The shock and disbelief continues to flesh out his more human, non-autistic character. Much later on in the book, Perturabo invites Fulgrim to meet him after they botch an operation. Fulgrim strides in five hours late, but Perturabo wears a calm, calculated mask and works on a project as he approaches. Fulgrim whines about being held up, and Perturabo, in a seeming attempt to reach the brother he once respected, lectures him like he would one of his own legion, asking him what he learned from wastefully losing a ship. Fulgrim, ignoring the question, fires back inquiring about the sketches in the room. The convo quickly moves to Fabius Pyle, Fulgrim's head apothecary, and the post-humans he's working on. Perturabo admonishes his work as wrong, but Fulgrim fires back with the same moral relativistic logic that Perturabo used on Kroger earlier in the books. It shows that despite what is happening, he still holds on to some of his same old moral principles and has not completely devolved like his brother. He ends that subconversation with a line that encapsulates what this Perturabo is all about and what I think he, as a character, should be entirely about. But I'll get to that later. Logic-driven wisdom. Fulgrim starts asking Perturabo about the perpetual motion machine he's working on. Pert tells him that it used to work, and Vulcan made it. Fulgrim immediately backhands Vulcan, saying he's nothing more than a weaponsmith, and Perturabo immediately puts the kibosh on that, and espouses Vulcan's love for the forge craft. Fulgrim is slash was a perfectionist, and would presumably know enough about his brothers to try to have the edge in statescraft, as well as being no chump in the various arts. See Ferris slash Pert's hammer. The implication that Perturabo knows and respects Vulcan better than Fulgrim is sweet in a whole new way. It makes you wonder what kind of relationship they had. Was he a Sundere, outwardly cold but secretly respected him, or was it like Magnus, not to spoil it, but one of mutual respect and admiration? If the latter, then the negative portrayal of him being a prickly pear to everyone is starting to have a few holes in it. Fulgrim straight up insults Vulcan, and Perturabo gives him the old, just come here, just come here, I just want to talk to you, I just want to show you this thing, so just come over here for a second, before he smashes his head into the machine by pulling his hair like some sort of shitty real housewife star who's had enough. He then proceeds to don Frey's face into a sloppy mess. Perturabo tells Fulgrim, I need a partner here, not just a good lay. And Fulgrim replies with, I'm the best lay. And, okay, maybe I misremembered that part, but it basically boils down to, you're trying to get me to be a team player by the barrel of a gun. And Pert relents, and in a somber, wise way, says history teaches us that we can only work in a win-win situation. I win by getting you to pull your shit together, and you win by not having your head pulped in like Gallagher trying to show off. Fulgrim agrees and basically walks away, flicking his collar and limping like a pimp who just got his ass beat but cannot not peacock. Also, after thinking about it, you could interpret Fulgrim insulting Vulcan as the last straw, and Pert smashing his face as the consequence. I mean, you probably shouldn't, but you could, and I find that almost sweet. Ending that scene, Perturabo, like a classic introvert, is drained from the social experience. Unlike other depictions of him being a self-centered egomaniac, despite his exhaustion, he asks Forex, another prong of the trident, what is causing his, I'm not mad, I don't know what you're talking about, I'll tell you at 3am when you're half asleep, girlfriend face. It ends with him saying, Pert, baby, I know you did what you had to do, but uh, maybe kicking the shit out of the most self-aggrandizing, egotistic narcissist in the galaxy, short of your average Dark Eldar, in front of his men, may not have been the best idea. I love this ending because it highlights that even if his reasoning is sound, he composes himself, makes the right moves at the right time, he still can come to the wrong conclusion. This is something to keep in mind later. But for now, let's move on to a pre-fall example in the Book of Magnus the Red, Master of Prospero. Here is one of the closest things to a friend I've seen Perturabo have. Despite one being into anime and D&D, and the other being into guns and trains, the dynamic is so enjoyable because of the common bond between these two autistic nerds. You can really feel a mutual respect for each other's capabilities, and it's almost like both can finally breathe, being around one of the only people in the entire galaxy who is on the same mental plane as each other. The following passage has been shown on YouTube a few times for good reason. It both highlights the virtues and vices of both brothers. 
You really believe there is some ancient knowledge buried in Zarukin that will explain why Morningstar survived Old Night unscathed? I am certain of it, said Magnus. In anyone else, I would say such certainty was arrogance, sighed Perturavo, letting the data on the plotter table disperse like smoke. When have I ever been wrong about such things? asked Magnus. Never, admitted Perturabo, stepping towards the sheet-covered workbenches at the perimeter of the mezzanine. But there's a first time for everything, and I need all of your warriors on board. But here, I wanted to show you something. The Primarch pulled back a white sheet to reveal a haphazard arrangement of half-finished projects, contraptions of mysterious purpose, and beautiful arrangement of gears and motors. This is my workshop, said Perturabo. It is just as I expected said Magnus, delightedly moving from bench to bench to examine the pieces lying around the edge of the workshop. He lifted a sheet of wax paper laid beside a partially completed model of a grand amphitheater. The Thalacron, said Magnus. You've begun work on it. Not yet, said Perturabo. Soon. When the crusade is done and we have heroic tales aplenty to fill it with song, then I'll build it. On the mountains across from Father's palace. I will be there to see it unveiled, promised Magnus, and his enthusiasm for his brother's works was genuine and contagious. He and Perturabo spoke as brothers who had shared every memory from birth to this moment, yet they had known each other for only a few short years. Magnus had once spoken of how he and Perturabo had spent time together on Terra, recovering the relic of a long-dead polymath and unearthing arcana from forgotten places of old Earth. Artharva had thrilled to hear such tales, relishing every opportunity to learn more of his gene sire. The obvious love between these godlike warriors filled the workshop with a swelling feeling of confraternity, a bond of brotherhood that could never be broken. This will be of interest to you, brother, said Perturabo, holding out a complex arrangement of curved metal, winding mechanisms, and adjustable lenses. I made a replica of the Antikythera, just like you asked. To see so delicate a mechanism in Perturabo's hands seemed incongruous, as most apparatus bearing the stamp of the Iron Warriors that Atharva had seen, save for those within this chamber, had been brutally functional. Does it work? I am not entirely sure, answered Perturabo. You never fully explained its intended purpose or how exactly it was designed to function. You built it, said Magnus. What do you think it does? I believe it to be some sort of navigational instrument, said Perturabo, lifting the device to look through one of its eyepieces. It has the look of a sextant once used by seafarers, but with infinitely more dimensions to its operation. What manner of ocean would you be navigating to require such a device? The Great Ocean, said Magnus. It allows even those without our gifts to perceive the realm beyond. Perturabo nodded and set down the Antikythera. Hmm. <sighs> I suspected as much, he said with a sigh, turning to lift something heavy from another part of his workbench. You remember what our father told us in the Hall of Leng, when he spoke of the warp and the dangers of looking too deeply into its heart. I do, said Magnus, but this has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with that, as you well know, but we will speak of this later. Perturabo's arm swung around and he smashed the delicate mechanisms of the Antikythera with a hammer. The metal of the device buckled and split, the precision ground lenses shattered into thousand fragments. Brother, no! cried Magnus as the pieces fell to the floor. Why? Perturabo replaced the hammer on his workbench and said, Because I will play no part in aiding you into delving into things you have been told to leave well alone. Our father knows more than us. He has seen further than us. If he tells us there are regions of the warp into which even he does not dare look, then we are beholden to accept that. Magnus stared at the ruined device in disbelief. Such a piece was the work of a master. A treasure that ought to have been held up as the epitome of the craftsman's art. Atharva saw Magnus's aura darken, like blood in the water. Knowing what you suspected, you could have destroyed the Antikythera any time after its completion, said Magnus with cold, controlled anger. But you waited until I was here to see you do it. Why? Because you needed to see it destroyed to truly understand. Magnus let out a breath. <sighs> you have a cruel streak in you, brother, he said. Perhaps, conceded Perturabo. 
But sometimes cruelty is the only way to make a point so clearly that no one can ever mistake its intent. The text is pretty on the nose about how these bros are nerding it out and loving each other's company. Uh, a little ham-fisted. I don't even think it needs it because it's 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 a really well-crafted scene outside of that to kind of express how these people feel about each other. This passage contains a constant reoccurring theme of Perturabo and an occasional one that I think should be way stronger. The former is that once again Perturabo is trying to teach as he did with his sons, as he will do with Fulgrim later on in the timeline, he tries to share important wisdom with people he cares about. One of the most important and insightful lines from any Primarch across Warhammer 30 through 40,000 is uttered right here. Our father knows more than us. He has seen further than us. If he tells us there are regions of the warp that into which even he does not dare look, then we are beholden to accept that. This piece of obvious wisdom could have saved so many countless lives if people like Logar stuck to it. You do not need to stare into the sun to understand it. You do not need to remove a fresh bandage and scrape off a scab to see if it's healed. You risk potential infection. Someone as versed in the occult like Magnus should know that speaking, even thinking about words, has power. Information you learn will affect the lens with which you perceive other things. There may very well be sights and horrors in the warp that can twist and corrupt a beings even as powerful as the Primarchs. Your thoughts create manifestations, physical monsters, and a very particular context, the ignorance may literally be the greatest strength you have against these sort of demons. Pert's wisdom, uh, in to give this all context, is probably informed by seeing a giant rend in the sky every time he looks up or closes his eyes. His role as a teacher here is sabotaged by his Lionel Johnson style autistic directness. If he was more like the angel and knew how to soften the blows, the lessons would probably sink in more and the recipients would probably be less actively hostile against his lessons. But if he was softer, he wouldn't be the, you know, Lord of Iron. This actually reminds you of Socrates being such a shit lesson purveyor that enough people voted him off the island with Hemlock. Him being a teacher is the former theme, but the far too rare latter theme is him being a beacon of good yet fallible wisdom. This discussion of themes leads us to our next section. As we can see from the schizophrenic writing, Perturabo is one of the least consistently portrayed people across all of the Black Library novels. So the most important question is, what should his character be? I think it should be a far more reluctant, tragic fall than a push that ignites an already primed and ready to rebel Primarch, as it is now. It seems like a waste that for a setting so steeped in Greco-Roman aesthetic that the Greek Primarch hailing from Olympia of all places should have such a relatively weak tragic tale. For the tragedy to really hurt, it has to have hope with an avoidable but logical fall. Then, if done properly, it will leave you with a constant feeling of almost daydreaming about what could have been. Out of the three depictions, let's drop the first, the dour, shitty attitude. Like vultures, we only pick at fleshy remaining bits of its carcass to use in a more thematic way that's more in line with his constant characterization. Perturabo should lean into the practical genius, humane and fallible, while adopting a logical and cold persona when in the zone. But over time, his life erodes him and his mask becomes his face, his true self, despite himself. Instead of contrivances like the Lair Blade for Fulgrim, or being set up to fall from the beginning like Angron, you should see a lot of future potential in Perturabo. He, like his legion, works together with the common trooper, as he understands the value of a pawn. His time on Olympia has made him cynical of humanity as a whole, particularly the ruling class, but he genuinely wants to do good, and that has never been eroded by his home people. He did, however, develop a cruel streak, coupled with a taste for debate. He is basically a fedora tipper, but much like them, he is only able to win the crowd over when he is overtly right, and he can't help but twist the blade. Perturabo can see all the weaknesses of the Imperium's massive bureaucracy, and the more he is forced to work with incompetent normal human commanders, the more it wears on him. He stays iron, until he brittles, and eventually breaks. He calculates so many potential points of failure in the Imperium machine, that he questions his own advice to Magnus. Should, nay, can he trust the Emperor? He ran the numbers with a pseudo-feudal system, it's bound to stagnate and fail in a thousand different ways. With Horus's supernatural charisma, he's able to push Perturabo over the edge, have him logic out some seemingly cogent reasoning, and reluctantly defect. 
While he recognizes his worst traits and tries to ebb them, they are exacerbated over time in proportion to his good traits being slowly whittled down by the constant human grind until he becomes cold and iron in both personality and philosophy. His relationship with his brother should change quite a bit. Instead of being cold and standoffish, he is aggressive and direct like Dorn, but instead of the grudging respect that he gets, Pert turns people off. Pert Rabo is an acquired taste. The more you're around him, the more you can get past the grating parts and see the value beneath. This is far easier with creatives like Vulcan, Ferris, and Fulgrim, or with the intellectuals like Korax and Magnus, excluding Lorgar. The pure warriors are a mixed bag. Some like the Lion or Jagatai see his worth, but range from indifferent to annoyed, or Russ or Angron just outright don't like him. I think he should have an all but outright hostile relationship with Lorgar. While they share a love for lively debates with Magnus, their worldviews are so antithetical to one another's that they get heated almost immediately whenever they speak. That would make their cooperation during the heresy that much more dependent on Horus, keeping it all together. Once he loses it, all cohesion is gone. Instead of the obnoxious Dorn rivalry, I think Robute is more his counterpart. In many ways, Robute is the other side of his coin. He is him, but everything he is not. Both have large, well-rounded legions. Both are materialists and rhetoricians. Gilliman is socially his better, where Perturabo is strategically. If they were to have public debates, which in an alternate timeline they definitely should have, Perturabo should be logically indisputable, but Robute should win as he coaches his arguments in a way that's not just cogent and sound, but more pleasing to the ears and persuasive. A Nixon versus JFK vibes. While they should be equal in most forms of combat, Perturabo should be the undisputed siege master, while Robute is the diplomat and politician. Gilliman should have a larger empire with a unified aesthetic, where Perturabo should be aesthetically innovative and more original. Due to their famous rivalry and relatively similar cultures, their sub-empires experience a lot of cultural exchange. McCrag should follow behind Olympian trends to Robute's chagrin. They should both despise Lorgar, having that in common, but Perturabo should be bitter a rare case instead of the norm, that he was not chosen to humble them, despite him being busy and Gilliman sending a very different message. The Ultramarines send a clearer visual message. Their aesthetic regalness sets the example of what a Marine should be far easier than the utilitarian roughness of the Iron Warriors. It should be a respectful rivalry until the heresy. Now, I'm not saying his rivalry with Dorne should be entirely done away with, but almost like uh, the lion wolf spat light. It starts as casual jokes among their legions, you know, unstoppable force versus an immovable object, until it becomes all too real at the Siege of Terra. I like the idea that they would almost bond by shit talking to each other. No direct hostility, but they are as blunt and cold with each other more than anyone else. Now that I think about it, almost like Warhammer dwarves in a sense. This applies to compliments too. They are not infrequent, but they are in context of each other's works, so it feels backhanded. They don't know if they are friendly or hate each other, or it just is. There is a point of contention, however, and it's with Perturabo's questioning of the Emperor. Where Dorn is a devout follower of their father, and defers to him no questions asked, Pert openly wonders and nitpicks the details. Dorn does not engage, and eventually shuts it down with the culmination of his thoughts, expecting and brooking no response, to where Perturabo would still shoot back to a brick wall. I like the idea that Dorne is the only brother he respects enough to share his criticisms of the Emperor, deferring to the Emperor's wisdom in any other circumstance. The idea that Dorne is ignorant of this respects adds even more tragedy, as Pert would never be in a situation to overtly explain that respect, and through happenstance, Dorne just so happens to never hear Perturabo defend the Emperor publicly. This ignorance leaves a small, almost unnoticeable seed of frustration within Dorne that blooms to full-blown hatred once the Horus Heresy happens. Dorne, in a small way, blames himself for the whole thing, feeling that in retrospect he should have known what all those doubts would lead to. These feelings and the fervor they bring up better highlights how the Black Templars are exemplars of this aspect of Dorne's personality. Perturabo functions as the connecting tissue between all the Primarch creatives, while he can be blunt and abrasive, he genuinely loves all creative endeavors. Where he and Dorne may clash, and he and Ferris may have pissing contests whipping out their hammers, when it comes to the art, they understand each other the way Perturabo understood Vulcan. After the heresy, Vulcan should be especially hurt at losing that connection with all of his brothers.
For his current story overall, there is so much arbitrariness, like his random, unexplained memory loss, or his weak feud with Dorne. His story could go from one of the worst to one of the best if it was focused. The themes that run through his story should be human nature in conflict with the logical mind, a teacher with good intentions but bad execution, a logical philosopher whose starting premise is informed by his trauma and cynicism. These are chosen for Perturabo as they are the juiciest reoccurring themes I've found while reading his books, and they have the most potential to lead him to a tragic fall. Human nature in conflict with the logical mind is there from the very start of his story. The decision whether or not to save the boy from the giant snake, where his nature is to help his fellow humans, and it's at odds with his engine, his logical reasoning. His powerful innate mental gifts, intentionally installed in him by the Emperor, directly conflicting with his just as intentionally innate nature, just screams constant drama, driven by hard choices. There is also the self-reflection and internal conflict. I can picture Sanguinius seeing that similar, almost melancholy soul in his eyes. Him reaching out to Perturabo, only for him to miss the point entirely and brush it off. Only just understanding the moment when it's far too late in the heresy leaving him wondering what could have been if he had not been so... so him. Moving on, there is already a running theme of him as a teacher, with good intentions but bad execution in the books as they exist, but make that far more front and center, and we can have great results. Like he's constantly trying to learn, as well as teach, and he can gain the wrong message, like Lorgar did from Monarchia. It could also make him endearing to some Primarchs, while despised by others who feel that they don't need to be lectured or talked down to by their brother. Perturabo as a philosopher, rather than solely a war machine who creates, adds more depth simply by having him weighing his options and the implications of those options. You can see him try to take a step back and look at his situation objectively. While it almost works, you can see that he progressively weighs the excess of human vice more and more throughout the series, all because his outlook was colored by his trauma and cynicism from Olympia. The bones are laid out about what he should be and where that generally should lead. Now we can add some meat and change up the major events in his life to be more in line with this new Perturabo. His early life. The idea that even the lowest shepherds on Olympia were as selfish as the most power-hungry political tyrants never made sense, without a good reason like them being previously disposed rulers or something. The idea that everyone is just out for personal gain, even people whose survival necessitates cooperation, is absurd. I think it makes far more sense for the lowly shepherd, whose life and livelihood is constantly at risk for monsters atop all other problems, to be far humbler grateful for the small mercies of life, knowing that it could all be taken away in an instant, whether from the tyrant or any other monsters. I think it would be far more interesting to have him be brought up by the shepherd's family, a demigod raised by mortals like Heracles. For some of the family, taking him in would almost be an act of substitution for the child they lost, while others would hold a grudge, hurt that he did not help save the boy when he showed that he easily could have by killing the monster, which he does. The lessons learned from the humble people with their kindness and compassion would shape Perturabo and make his eventual disgust at the rulers of Olympia more meaningful. His adoptive parents try to shelter him from the corruptive influence of the ruling class and keep his existence relatively hush-hush as they know that if the tyrant found out about him, he would take him as a tyrant is ought to do. Unfortunately, after he helps them by killing all the monsters around their lands, helping engineer them a new home, lush, self-sustaining, mountainous agriculture, and generally a better way of life, word gets out. The powers that be, like in the normal timeline, offer a reward, and the dead shepherd's brother or another family member sell Perturabo out. A large squad of soldiers go to his house to escort Perturabo. He goes, half out of curiosity and half out of a protective instinct for his family and not wanting them to get caught between the fight. The human social dynamic and danger is new to him, and he wants to learn and observe firsthand what his family has been so concerned about. He makes a deal with the tyrant to help out temporarily. Perturabo knows that there will be no peace with this shrewd man, and only plans to stick around so he can learn more about this world and find the most efficient way to help its people, like his family. There's only one problem. Memory loss. 
while he's at court, his memory loss begins. So with a snap, he finds a broken old super efficient steam powered engine from the dark age of technology. But as he examines it, he feels a sharp pain like ringing tinnitus. The engine deconstructs in his mind and he knows everything about it and how to easily fix it. But his memories of his time in the pod become hazy. The loss is gradual at first, but it slowly eats away at his memories of his time before the courts of Olympus. He knows that he is losing his memory, but the harder he tries to access him, the more the loss speeds up. So, all he knows while he's there is that he's disgusted with everyone around him, and he's missing something. There are people he feels he needs to go out to protect, but the memories of the good people are slowly eroding and being re replaced by the serpents of the court. The tyrant slyly notices this, but does not give the game away, and uses it to his advantage to keep Perturabo at his court. The closest thing to undoing himself is recommending Perturabo to see the oracle. His advisors question him, and he replies, with whatever he is, he's still a godly man, and if it is their will to fix him, so be it. The oracle is a powerful psyker, and regretfully confirms that he is losing his memories, and that if he had come to her sooner, then she would have been able to have uh, taught him a way to prevent it, as he has the power of the gods, i.e. enough latent psyker to make it work. Overcome with sorrow and rage at a loss he cannot name, he has an uncharacteristic outburst. Whether he destroys a table, nearly strangles her, or just wanders off, there's nothing he can do. Keeping those memories would potentially keep him a loyalist, maybe even make him the Heracles to Russ's Thor, but it is a question never to be answered, for the man with the most perfect edict memory barely has any recollection of his early years in the Olympian courts. As a very quick aside, there is an interesting exchange in Angel Exterminatus, where Perturabo seems to remember his time as a test tube baby with the Emperor, where Fulgrim does not. This part seems to be retconned by the Hammer of Olympia and the Emperor's Architect, as Angel Exterminatus was released in 2013, and the other two were released in 2017 and 2020 respectively. Now I'd totally be down to ret retcon this, but i just put this here as a way to make his memory loss work. I think there's way more tragedy in him having a kind and caring family like Gilliman, and it still all goes to hell and he just regrets it and he's filled with rage and cold bitterness. Paranoia The word in reference to Perturabo has always felt heavy and inappropriate to me. However, Merriam-Webster defines paranoia as the following. Mental illness characterized by systematized delusions of persecution or grandeur, usually without hallucinations. And a tendency on the part of an individual or group towards excessive and irrational suspicions and distrustfulness of others. I think it means the second one. Now this does make sense within the context of Olympia with this passage from the Hammer of Olympia. A serving girl filled it. He took a deep draft and offered it to Perturabo. Perturabo just stared at him. He will not drink it explained Domikos. Why not? Because Sinar of Soldalin tried to poison him with a cask of gifted wine. Alas, this and other attempts on his life have made him suspicious of others. The other tyrants are so jealous of my foster son. Adolphus made a sour face and a noise in his throat to accompany it. The day a man of Olympia loses his paranoia is the day he loses his life, he said. Then I toast to your good health, young Perturabo. The only people he knew well were those ever-scheming aristocrats, but the problem I have is within the next passage. He was not at peace yet. His heart thundered with nervous energy. His mind crowded itself with a hundred different possible outcomes of the meeting. Anxiety turned most of them bad. He feared he would not be recognized, or that he would be deemed unworthy, or that he would find his father cruel, or that he had been wrong and it was not his father after all. Positive possibilities dwindled under the weight of his paranoia, inherent to him but honed by years of life among the Olympians. He had lost count of how many plots he had foiled against his life. There was a chance this miracle was but the latest. Inherent to him, but honed by the years of life among the Olympians? He's just naturally mistrusting? How do you square that with the reaction in Emperor's Architect where he brings the head of the monster earnestly, expecting nothing more than maybe a head pat and an attaboy? and is greeted with the desire to use him for selfish gain. The shepherd looked at the trophy. You killed the Jalpida. 
I did, said Perturabo. You have taken seven of my flock. Perturabo stared at him impassively. But this has taken far more, said the man, and it took my son. You have avenged him. I have. What is the price? Perturabo frowned. What do you want? said the shepherd. For their service, everything has a price. Perturabo's quick mind analyzed the shepherd's speech patterns, refining his own command of the language as he spoke. I do not want anything. The shepherd was confused. Then why did you help us? Perturabo thought. It was right. You are weak and I am strong. You have come to protect us? The man looked hopeful. It was a piteous expression. The young Primarch stared at the shepherd, then gave a single hesitant nod. Yes, that is what I am for. To protect and to improve. Another sentiment crossed the shepherd's face. It was an expression Perturabo was to learn to despise in the coming years. All Olympians, no matter how humble, were skilled in exploiting situations to their advantage. If he had known that, he would have turned and walked back into the high peaks and dealt no more with men. It is apparently so innate that it appears as an effect of his gene seed implantations that you can see here from Index Astartes 1. They have a marked tendency towards suspicion and paranoia, but are also extremely intelligent with naturally well-developed problem-solving skills. While the gene seed made me do it does work as a hand-wavy excuse to make him and his sons dour and shitty, I can think of a different way of going about this. While being raised by dicks would fuck up a normal kid, I think a Primark is made of sterner stuff. At worst, his time on Olympia would be in preparation for dealing with the aristocracy of the Imperium, giving him a chip on his shoulder and a head start on how to deal with them more than any other social interaction. The closest thing to innate paranoia Perturabo should have should not come from some genetic quirk, but a reasonable reaction to having the eye of terror constantly looking down on him with no context. A man whose entire universe not only makes perfect logical sense, but also unfolds itself like a diagram in his mind, has one giant floating aberration that not only can no one else understand, but they can't even see it. I think this should make him more skeptical, and if anything, less egotistic, as there's a giant floating testament to his incomplete understanding of the world around him. The Eye of Terror would enforce his already genetic deferment to the Emperor, but open up his relationship with Magnus, having him be the in-between for questions about the warp. While he can talk to Magnus and try to work out his ignorance about the warp and its relation to reality, when Lorgar is involved, he becomes incensed and will argue, not in good faith towards understanding, but to crush that arrogant ass who is, to him, just the final boss of every religious sophist he's dealt with on Olympia. Decimation. Destroying his legion by a tenth for not being good enough is bullshit, plain and simple. I can't imagine the pert from Angel Exterminatus doing that. Hell, I can't even imagine the shitty pert from his origins doing that either, especially after being so pumped to meet his father, and him committing decimation is all but immediately after reuniting with his legion. Now, devil's advocate time. One could argue it's from a point of ego. Seeing his legion based on his own gene seed as a logical extension of himself, he saw failure in himself and wanted to kill that weakness. And since he was a massive fish in an incredibly small pond, comparing his legions to that of his brothers, his only equals, that he may snap and order something so horrible. That is the only justification I could think that works, and I still think it's kinda weak. At that point his ego is nowhere near large or fragile enough to justify that barbarity. Look at how he interacts with Magnus and the Emperor. He trusts in the Emperor, and is wise enough to understand that the Emperor has a reason for what he's doing, even if he doesn't share it with him, and that his brothers are formidable and worthy of respect. We are at a crossroads. We can either keep the decimation and fix it best we can, or replace it with a better reuniting origin story that fits his themes. If you had to have it. A better idea than them not being perfect is that he watches a picked recording of their most recent battle. He watches as they crack open a particularly hard siege, the men break in and as they do their opponents surrender, but the iron warriors run rampant like frost wolves or night lords. They absolutely slaughter them, wasting human capital and more of their own dying needlessly. The pressure required at being the best siege specialists build up in them as they methodically break in, and once they do they let loose. Maybe. There's a particular type of person who's capable of performing that horrible type of siegecraft and not buckling. 
and that type of person feels the need to let loose. Perturabo is disgusted by the lack of discipline and wastefulness of it all. It reminds him of the normal humans on Olympia doing the same thing, and he feels his space marines should be better than that. He also thinks it reflects on him, since it's his gene sons that are lacking discipline and potentially some of that exploding rage may not just be from the recruits, but the gene seed itself. That is really his failing, and that eats at him. He signs them up for another, even worse siege as the first mission. They do it again, he stops it. He orders decimation right there in front of their surrendered enemies, shaming the entire legion to its core. He tells them that he requires them to be iron within and iron without. If we're forming an alternate reuniting origin story for Proterabo and his legion, it needs to fit his themes. He takes his time to meet every single one of his legionaries and challenges them to whatever they're best at explicitly stating it is not limited to warfare, as the skills and iron it takes to excel at one subject transfers to all sorts of subjects. More succinctly, competence is cross-disciplinary. He uses the subject of their choice, plus their means of executing their challenges, to gauge each member. Most challenges go the same way, with the major exceptions being three that either beat him, or three got so close it made Perturabo work to win. Those few became his first trident, as they showed value through their virtues. He uses these challenges to teach each one of them something, whether it is something with their subject or a personal lesson about their virtues or vices. He takes special notes of those who taught him something, and either records it mentally for later, or actively acknowledges it with some sort of badge of honor. It's not all good, however, as his cynicism affects a small portion of his assessments, overlooking or underappreciating some. For all of his prowess, his greatest weakness is still his people skills. While this is somewhat similar to another Primarch's, I can't recall if it's the Lion or the Angel, I think it's specific enough and in keeping with his themes that it does not reek of derivation. Let me know what you think. His Fall Let's state the obvious. Destroying one world, even his homeworld, hell, especially his homeworld, who is actively rebelling and thinking it's enough for the Emperor to scatter his legion, is ridiculous. Even steelmanning the argument that Perturabo was hyper-emotional and was snapping himself due to just enduring an excruciatingly long, grinding campaign against the Herod, a time-dilating Xeno who could turn you to dust if there are enough of them and they get close enough, it doesn't explain the reasoning. Cruz and Lorgar have done much worse to way more planets, and assuming even if Pert somehow didn't know about them, the Emperor gave the Primarchs carte blanche to rule their worlds how they saw best. More popular legions have done worse for less. Another quick side note, the entire Herod campaign and his reaction to the Warpsmith's quote-unquote failures, big quotes, was silly. Given Pert's tactical acumen, he could easily have ran the simulation of their fights in his mind, considered their status, equipment, manpower, knowledge of the enemy at the time of confrontation, etc., and dollars to donuts even with hindsight, I bet if he put himself in their shoes, he probably would, nay, could not have done much better. Further, a huge part of that book was that Perturabo did more and more of the fighting himself. It doesn't make any sense that he would be so cross with their failure when he could have given them better orders if he could. It was just so dumb. But I am not here to criticize without giving something I think works better. What would a better reason for Perturabo's fall be? I think Perturabo should be frustrated after dealing with a disastrous campaign, which he blames on the actions of a member of the Council of Terra. Little does he know, the man's seemingly erratic and illogical actions were direct orders from Malkador for some esoteric purpose. While he respects the foresight of the Emperor, his cynicism and experience of actual incompetence from unqualified nobility has left him exasperated at best and scornful at worst with baseline human leadership. He has made it no secret that he disagrees with the concept of the council. If not the emperor's wisdom in it, then at least the timing and rushed nature of its enactment while the great crusade still goes on. In fact, he is a vocal objector to it in a similar fashion as Mortarian was to the use of psychers. Once he has a moment to breathe, he is informed of a meeting request with the War Master as soon as he's available. His psychers send word, and Horus appears unnervingly quickly, almost as if the warp desperately wants him there. Horus conveys terrible news that their beloved brother Magnus, one of the very few Primarchs that Perturabo can call a true friend, is missing, and Prospero burns. 
Horace straight up lies to Pert, telling him Russ was like an animal up for blood on the Emperor's orders. Pert has an all but hostile relationship with Russ, as he is outwardly a brute who does not create, only destroys. Pert Rabo's bias and cynicism clouds his logic, and his love for Magnus overrides any red flags his logical mind may be setting off about Horace's story. In this moment of rare emotional weakness, Horace uses his supernatural charisma, which is further buffed by the warp, to walk Perturabo through the math at how wasteful and detrimental the loss of Magnus and his sons are to the Imperium. Horace gets to really show off his persuasion by sleight of handing every illogical move as a mark against the Emperor's perfection instead of a flaw in his own story. It gets so bad that Horace all but gaslights Perturabo into thinking he convinced Horace to rebel and that it's a necessary evil for the betterment of humanity to throw off this oppressive, irrational, wannabe god. From there on out, Perturabo gets sucked too deep. He's closest to the traitor legionaries in that he has to force himself to buy the bullshit that they are selling, like an angel exterminatus not calling themselves traitors because deep down, he is the only Primarch who regrets the heresy. That feeling is buried deep with the memory that he forgot something he needs to protect on Olympia. If my depiction of Perturabo as he exists now in the lore is fair and accurate, I don't think anyone can argue that he's a good character. He is so inconsistently written that he's barely a character at all, more a caricature, a meme, an idea of a person any writer wants or needs him to be in the moment perpetually informed by the angry autistic mystique that surrounds him. Out of all the Primarchs in the Horus Heresy novels, his depiction is the closest to the idea that the truth of the events were lost to time and are just hearsay. But within that vague mist lies the potential for a compelling and tragic character. The Perturabo I describe, I believe, rectifies that. The fantastic traits of a demigod, but at his core human. In his desires, his relationships, and his failings. His time on Not Greece developed him for better or worse as a person, and I think that is more interesting than he's a paranoid schizophrenic with a gun. Okay, that sounds great, but it doesn't come off nearly as unpredictable and as wild as that sounds. He's just a shitty loner. Him actually having brotherly relationships makes the drama among all of them feel more impactful, while keeping enough space between him and the other brothers he doesn't have an inherent interesting interactions with, so it doesn't feel like a cluttered soap opera. On the other end, the thematic throughline between all his actions help keep the events logical and in character, rather than random, arbitrary, and hand-waving. Well, that's enough for what I think. Let me know what you think about my proposed changes. Do you think they work? Make sense to the story? Fit his theme? Do you think the themes I laid out are appropriate for him? Which decimation replacement makes more sense with his character, or is more interesting to you? Do you have any better ideas for Perturabo? Because I actually want to hear it. Obviously, I really dig the character and would like to, at least even if it's in my own head, see him reach his potential. So I'm all ears and, and probably reply to each and every comment obsessively or something. If you like the character reconstruction, like the video, do the and stupid sub thing, um, and just let me know. I love writing and the interaction with any art I create motivates me to do more of this. At the end of the day, the stuff I make is just things I think are cool and don't exist yet, so sharing that firsthand really makes me happy. On that note, I have my second entry in my Warhammer alternate history series, The Angel Apostasy, in the works. It's the Hammer of Olympia himself, Perturabo. In the meantime, check out my first one, Vulcan's Inferno. Spoilers, it's got a lewd, gross, dark Eldar homunculus scene. It's fucked up, and I'd love for as many people to see it as possible. Thanks for watching. Until next time, see you. Thank you.